Okay, good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. Smiles. All right. We're here for our weekly Board of Commissioners meeting. It's Wednesday, November 24th, 2021. Um, it is 9 a.m. We're in the Senator hearing room, and this is a historical week. Every year. Every year. We all know what that is. I have to be really careful, but um, I was educated. In fact, I have a, a portrait of Abraham Lincoln uh, in my office because he was probably my greatest hero as a president of the United States and the decisions he made to free slaves and, and uh, when he was against all odds. And uh, this week I'm going to say it because we have the Civil War here in uh, the state of Oregon and I forgot to wear my orange tie today so <laughs> I want everybody to know that I'm uh, <laughs> I am representing for us both. <laughs> so, so I guess uh, Jan where's your green? So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I opt out. <laughs> All right. So uh, we have some business to do today, but uh, I just want to say good luck to uh, the Oregon State Beavers and the uh, the game, whatever they call it now, down in Eugene. But we we uh, affectionately and rightly so. Um, uh, I know when Sam was here, we used to call it Duck Hate Week. So. Even though we love you ducks that are here today, right? They don't believe it. You can't say that Come and on. then say we love you. I right? always say that to my, duck, to my duck friends. There are good people in bad places. All right, let's go. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to be in deep trouble, right, Jan? Does she I got your back. Ahead? It's totally fine. Where's, our, once where's once our legal counsel here? It's totally fine. We can do this once a year. All right. I forgot my type. So first up, we have presentations yeah, today. Uh, we have Project Joy. Um, and uh, we've Wait, got. Do you want to do the pledge? Oh yeah, I got too far off on the Civil Sorry. War, didn't I? Civil War. Let's do the pledge of allegiance. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Why don't you start us off? Okay. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You did that good, you know. You're get you're, you're all ready to go next year. I can tell. I'm going to take a break before I take over that seat, so I'll be really prepared for January. Okay, good. <laughs> Are you now? Ready? We, now we can do presentations. Uh, Project Joy. So we have Kathy and who else is here today? Hi. Kate, Kylie. All hey, right. Kaylee. Kaylee. Welcome. Thank you. I saw some neat. Tonka trucks in our office already. Oh, pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> okay, thank you. So my name is Kathy Bolin, and I'm the Culture and Engagement Coordinator here at Marion County, and I'm here today with Kaylee Kinsey. She's with Project Joy. Um, and we're here today in front of you to talk about the Project Joy annual fundraiser that Marion County sort of sponsors every year. And our county has had a really long-standing relationship with this project and has been supported by the board for several years, many, many years. So um, foster kids are some of the most vulnerable in our community, and so I wanted to share some statistics with you. All right, so in 2019, there were less than 250 certified foster care homes in Marion County and approximately 700 children in the foster care system. And the majority of these kids are under 12, excuse me, under 12 years of age, and they move around quite a bit. They typically only stay in one place for about 18 months, and they're moved on. Um, you know, children enter the foster care system typically due to some sort of abuse or neglect made, that made their home unsafe for them to be in, whether it was um, parental substance abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, abandonment, um, all of those things can happen uh, to foster kids. And so in turn, many of these kids experience physical, emotional, developmental, educational, or behavioral problems. Um, so these foster families really do a lot for the children. And the state provides for the general care and special needs of these foster kids, but the funds don't normally stretch far enough to include things like birthdays and Christmases. 
So each year, we're provided with a wish list for these children, and last year, we received a list from 88 families and 202 foster children in their care, and we were able to fulfill every single request, and then some. Um, our staff purchased over 400 gifts, and that included toys, uh, clothes, diapers, hygiene products, all of those things. Marion County, through the support of our employees and community, we raised almost $69,000 through those gifts that I mentioned, through monetary donations, and we also had a very generous contribution from a local business owner who lost her business due to COVID. And it was a beauty supply company, and she donated cases and cases of high-end shampoos and conditioners, styling tools, tote bags, um, hair brushes. Uh, we just, there was so much. Um, and so it just goes to show that even through a pandemic and wildfires, the generosity of our employees and our community is really astounding. So this year, Project Joy kicked off on November 15th after Marion County foster parents provided us with their 2021 wish list. Um, and we have the opportunity now to fulfill those requests from those families. And this year we have 50 families. We're supporting 128 youth. And addition, uh, in addition to those wishes, we're also asking for, um, of course, diapers and hygiene items. But this year we've added pajamas, backpacks, and of course, monetary donations are always welcome. So without the support of our commissioners and our awesome and generous staff every year, we wouldn't be able to fulfill the holiday wishes for these local foster children. So I wanted to come and thank you for your support in that. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Kaylee Kinsey with Project Joy and um, allow her to share some of the great information about how these donations have impacted the kids in our community. Hi there. I just want to, on behalf of all the families, again, say thank you so you much for your support. introduce yourself for the record. Oh, yeah. I'm Kaylee Kinsey. I'm the Project Joy coordinator. And, um, you know, we, we really rely upon our community support and your guys' support has just been um, tremendous and we're so thankful. And all of the families just, I mean, just an outpouring of, of appreciation come from them. And, um, you know, just to be able to bring joy to these children um, during tough times in their lives uh, is just, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, we're just so thankful for all of you. And um, the gifts that were given this year, this last year, really uh, gave all year long. <laughs> Uh, we were able to host uh, several giveaways, one in February, one in July, and one in September. And with all of those donations and ec extra things, we were able to support them during birthdays and um, back to school and uh, a lot of other um, type of events, you know, holidays and things. Um, and so we're just uh, just so thankful for everything. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so we'd like to just open it up to any questions or comments mm -hmm. you might have. Well, I love this every year. It's one of my favorites. I guess I do have a question. We we changed the name. From Saint yes, to yeah. Joy. So we we, we used to function under the uh, Marion Polk Yam Hill Foster Parent Association, and the association dissolved uh, in 2019. And um, I'm sorry, 2020. <laughs> um, and I was on the on the board um, with the association, and just felt like this program was something that needed to keep going. And so. I, um, I went out looking for a new sponsor, and the Oregon Foster Parent Association, uh, particularly Don Darlin, who's just a wonderful, wonderful person, um, was, was more than eager to adopt our program and was able to keep it going. And so we're just so thankful to them, too, because they, they manage all of our finances and kind of take, take us under their wing. <laughs> um, and then I do most of the coordinating with um, getting the families to apply and getting their requests and, and everything. And then, of course, organizing it and making sure that um, everybody gets their gifts that they requested. Thanks for all your work. Why did our local association dissolve? Uh, a couple of factors. Um, the president of the association was having um, just some challenges with um, with COVID and, and getting some participation. And our board was functioning at around four really active members. We had nine members, but only about four of us were really doing the work. Um, so that made it very challenging for all of us. Um, 
I, I asked to continue the, you know, to continue the association, but um, was kind of outvoted <laughs> on that. But um, you know, in the end, it, it's it's honestly just amazing how it all turned out. Um, and even though the association is gone, and that was a huge loss to our community, um, we were able to keep this program going. And I'm so thankful. For yeah, that. thank you for that. Yeah, thanks for your commitment to this program. Absolutely, I'm very committed to it, and um, I'm really passionate about it. Um, you know, the families in our area just really need, they need that support and they need that appreciation, you know, for the work that they do and how, how difficult it is um, to carry on each day. It just something, it's something that brings something joyful to their lives and I'm, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Are you sure? I don't have any questions, okay. but I'm Good. excited to see it. <coughs> Great. The toys just keep piling up upstairs. Good, <laughs> good. One of those trucks. Yeah. We'll send some little elves to pick them up soon. Yeah. <laughs> and if anyone ever wants to come and, and help with the giveaway, we'd love to have you. <laughs> when is it? Uh, it's September, or sorry, December 17th and 18th, we'll be uh, giving things um, to the families. Um, we're going to be at Court Street Church in, um, in Salem here. Oh, good. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'll be out of state this year, but maybe oh. next year. The weekend before that, though, you can join me in Kaiser at the Kaiser <laughs> Network of Women's Giving Basket. Oh, program, very nice. You can deliver to their homes. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> There's lots of great projects like this throughout Marion County. Oh, for sure. It's a blessed county. Yeah. Yeah, I know um, the uh, D Detroit, they're doing the Santa mm -hmm. um, thing at the Christmas tree lighting for the kids that, that are up there, too. So there's spread out and there's probably many others that are going on i just go to detroit for the candy canes oh okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay great thank you very much for your work on this and for what you're doing for our community Absolutely. and those those uh, kiddos that that uh need the extra lift and surprise so thank you. thank you thank you okay our next presentation um Wow, we haven't seen her in like two and a half years. Um, <laughs> COVID-19 COVID update. We've got, uh, oh, we have a special guest today. Anthony, good to see you. Other than on Zoom, when I get to see you every other week. And Katrina is here, so welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Katrina Rothenberger, Public Health Division Director with Marion County Health and Human Services. And then Anthony Belize from ESO Public Relations and Marketing is joining me today to talk a little bit about the work that they've been doing with the vaccine equity dollars that were distributed uh, at the end of 2021. I do have a few things to share first. Um, There's a lot of updates that happened in the past month, so I'll share those and then turn it over to Anthony. Uh, currently, our seven-day daily case average is 72, and we saw an 11% decrease in cases from November 7th through the 20th compared to October 31st through November 13th. Uh, during that time period, 11-7 through 11-20, there were 995 cases with an 8.6% positivity rate. Um, yesterday, the outdoor mask mandate was removed for large public gatherings, and then that change to the outdoor face covering rules mean that local school districts, charter schools, pri private schools will be able to set their local requirements for the use of face coverings outdoors. Um, Out outdoors. Outdoors, right. <clears throat> Uh, currently, kids have to wear their face coverings during recess and outside time. Um, they also announced yesterday the test to stay protocol to help reduce the need for quarantining kids and, keep, and to keep them in the classroom longer. This is a, a long awaited uh, program that I'm really excited. We'll be hopefully rolling out in every community in Oregon. Um, it's available for unvaccinated asymptomatic individuals who are exposed in indoor and outdoor school settings where masking is fully in place. Um, indoor and outdoor exposures are reviewed for their proximity and duration of the exposure. And the test to stay is not to be used for extracurricular or um, community or in-home exposures. It allows students to be tested twice during seven days following their exposure. 
Uh, first, as soon as the exposure has been identified with a second test occurring between days five and seven following the exposure. It's a form of modified quarantine which allows students to attend school during their seven day quarantine period. Um, we do want those students to participate in quarantine outside of the classroom settings, however. Um, and then they may also participate in extracurricular activities during their seven day quarantine period, but must wear a face covering during those times. And then turning over to vaccinations, um, there have been a couple of recent announcements. Uh, now everyone over the age 18 and over is eligible for a COVID-19 booster dose. Um, it is highly encouraged for everyone um, 50 and over and those 18 and older who live in a long-term care facility and anyone who received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. <clears throat> Currently, 73.9% of people 18 and over have had at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine in Marion County, and 61.3% of all ages have had one, at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, which includes 2,824 kids who are newly eligible to receive the vaccine, kids 5 to 11. Many pharmacies and healthcare providers have the vaccine in stock for uh, the pediatric COVID-19 vaccine. And as of this morning, when I checked the OHA website, about 60,000 five to 11 year olds have had at least one dose of the vaccine in Oregon. <clears throat> um, I did take my five year old to get her shot uh, last week. Uh, she is pretty irritated that she has to get a second shot mm -hmm. in two weeks, but uh, she just had a sore arm and no other symptoms and went to school the next day. So um, she'll be fully vaccinated by Christmas and I'm really thankful. So um, I know a lot of parents might be concerned and worried and wanting to wait a little while to see how the vaccine may affect, affect other kids. So um, I just wanted to share that personal story of mine. Um, Monday was also Thank You Public Health Week, or P Thank You Public Health Day, and we received a box of goodies from Oregon State University College of Public Health and Human Sciences, so I'll be cheering for them on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway. Uh, Did you get anything from the ducks? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> they better get busy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's, it was all great. Um, we've been working closely with both universities throughout the pandemic, and it's been a great relationship. So um, I'll turn it over to Anthony to introduce himself, and he has a PowerPoint to share as well. Okay, buenos dias. Good morning, um, Chair Cameron, Commissioners, Marion County staff. My name is Anthony Velis, and I'm the owner and founder of ESO Public Relations and Marketing. We are a multicultural marketing agency located in what I believe the heart of the Latino community in Woodburn, Oregon. Um, we do, we specialize in the Latino community in our communication, our work. A little bit about me, uh, I have a special fondness for public servants because I was a, I've been a school board member in Woodburn, a city councilor, and I served, just finished serving eight years on the State Board of Education. I was the chair the last two years of my service, and um, so I, Thank you for your service, I'll start there. <laughs> I know it's a lot. <laughs> and um, can't make everybody happy all the time, I totally understand that. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. It, it gets a little challenging <laughs> at 197 school districts, and you have one school district with 10, literally students, and the other one with like 5,000 you know, or more, right? Um, so, uh, it, Anthony, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but <clears throat> it was interesting. Uh, we were at AOC conference, the Association of Oregon Counties, and there's one county, Wallala County has less citizens in it than we have employees in yep. Marion County. I mean, yep. that's the difference between, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, we have, what, 1,600, 1,700 employees, and they have, like, 1,200 citizens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Their, their leadership is fierce and very wise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed them. Well, it's really, like I said, school board, there's yeah. school districts with, like, 10 students, literally, and the superintendent is the um, coach, and the, they play, they go four days yeah. a week. I don't know if people know that. They play sports on Saturdays. A lot of people don't know that, right? But we have seen, really, really small school districts. That, you've seen one school district. You, you've seen one school district. You've seen one school district. It's the same with <laughs> counties, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So moving on, though, um, again, I was um, 
Um, thank you, uh, Katrina, for running that. We, we were charged to uh, support the communication um, efforts here in Marion County in Spanish, and we did that. You can go ahead and, um, sorry, to go ahead and, and um, move the slide. I'll just kind of wave or something. But we, we, the strategy really is, uh, well, the goal is to obviously increase the number of vaccinations that are um, in the Latino community here in Marion County. And we did that, um, so our target audience, again, is the Latino community. Uh, a lot of people, especially those that are uninsured or underinsured, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there, so we were trying to educate them. And, um, and then talk about, you know, there's folks that are in the different immigration status, so we wanted to make, try to take the fear out of, their, out of them coming forward and getting the vaccination, so go ahead. Next one. <clears throat> So our communication goal, uh, bless you, our communication goal is to create awareness and encourage vaccination through trusted community-based organizations. So we are partnering uh, with three trusted organizations. Uh, one of them is Pecun, which is the Farm Worker Union in Woodburn, uh, Mano a Mano, which is in Salem, and then Interface Network, which is also in Salem. Um, they've got a base that they work with, a community, and they've been here for, some of them, for decades. So we felt that was really important to partner with them so that they could kind of see a familiar face in our communication, so to speak. Um, another goal was to create a uh, communication goal, create easy access to the information regarding vaccine, testing, vaccination sites, et cetera. Um, we we um, provide a number, and I'll show you the creative assets that we have created. But a lot of people just think, you know, instead of there's a digital divide, so we wanted to give them not only the digital option, but the phone option where they could actually call and someone directly. So we really tried to just create our, our, um, our communication in a really familiar, relatable, uh, understood, you know, kind of going through all the jargon and really just kind of creating something that more like a casual conversation. So go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> uh, these are, again, um, our creative approach is really just about positive messages. So in this campaign, you know, there's a lot of strategies. Some people obviously the gloom and doom and the neg kind of negative, <coughs> excuse me, but we took the approach of, of making our messages positive and um, more informative, educational, and, and welcoming. So go ahead. <coughs> so uh, probably can't see the whole thing, uh, but yeah, this is our, our campaign in a nutshell overview. Um, if you've been driving around Salem at all, uh, we're doing billboards, uh, video ads, which means like YouTube ads. Those have been very effective, especially the 15 and 30 second ads. Um, they don't, people can listen to them while they're, you know, um, on the social media. They can actually watch the video. All the local radio stations uh, we've partnered with, uh, television, even though we know television is, goes, you know, everywhere, but that is consumed. There's Univision, that's the main. Uh, there's a local affiliate here, so we felt we needed to get on that. We've done printed flyers. Uh, social media is huge, and we've done some out of home. Um, we're going to be on a chariot, using chariot as as a as another vehicle. Go ahead. Next one. So these are these are some of our ads. Uh, not all of them. Uh, social media. Ads. They're in Spanish, but um, you know, in general, the big le uh, letters say, "Do you have um, questions um, regarding the vaccine?" And, um, and they talk about radio programs that their community are familiar with that they can listen in on. Again, these are kind of dated already. And, uh, but these, we're having like, a, like a, there's a community hour, so to speak. And so we're having people that are there talking about um, the back, you know, get, why you should get vaccinated, et cetera. And then we're trying to drive um, people, listen, people that will listen to that. So go ahead. Uh, these are, again, some of our uh, social media posts. The one to my far left, um, if you have any questions uh, regarding the vaccine, there's that number again that I talked about. If you look on the lower right-hand corner of these ads, those are our three community partners, so people can, that can relate to that. Um, the middle one is a cute one, right? Um, um, our heroes need heroes, so that's just kind of a little message there. And then the, the one on the far right means together we can make a difference. So just very positive, kind of um, not really uh, totally like serious, and this is like doom and gloom, but really trying to encourage people. Go, go ahead. Um, and again, these are some of our, um, oops, the locations that are providing the free vaccination. And uh, we're trying to, again, helping with our, our partners, uh, which include, um, you can see a longer list of partners, but uh, Marina Ariola, who couldn't be here of Interface uh, Network, 
is really leading a lot of this great work. And so it's a lot of, it's a lot of work, right? Showing up, showing up, showing up. There's a lot of coordination, as you know, Katrina, with, with the actual people that can give and administer the vaccines. And, and so, and they're getting pulled a lot of different places. So uh, my hats to, to Katrina and Marine and all the people that are doing that work, because that behind the scene, it doesn't just happen, right? It's a lot of work, as you know. It does not just happen. Yeah, exactly. And we're still, we're still working. So go ahead and um, so these are some of the billboards. Um, I want they kind of similar message. If you could go to the next one, I think there's some examples of billboards that you will see. Um, you know, the really the target market are children and families. And then as you see, uh, the, the bottom one says you are essential. So some of our essential workers, which are agriculture workers, <coughs> farm workers in the Latino community, um, the 30 to 50 year olds are kind of a lot of people who are end up in the ICU, and so we wanted to make sure that we uh, targeted them as well. So go ahead. And we've got radio as well. Uh, this is again a Spanish, uh, Spanish language radio script between a woman and a man asking um, about information, you know, uh, about the vaccine and, and then um, where you can get where you can get the information. So. Again, in Spanish, <laughs> that's our target market, and that's all I have uh, for you is high-level uh, overview, but do you have any questions? So, so, Anthony, thank you for your work on this and, and uh, the whole uh, community that's worked on this. I know um, Raina and her folks have been making phone calls, you know, and all that. Yesterday, I was driving in, uh, coming in from Detroit and came down the hill where our sheriff normally uh, just <laughs> pointing radar. So you always slow down there. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, all of us that drive in mm -hmm. from, the, yeah. <coughs> yep. from the east side. We all know where to break. And yep. the electronic yep. billboard came up. The middle, the middle one, uh, the two slides back. The middle one yeah. was up. You know how those electronic yeah. billboards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I saw it, and I go, "Hey, you can, you know, starting. You can yep. really see it happening out there." So. Um, I got to witness it personally, and I'm not even the demographic that you're after. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's it's really good to see that. So thank you for all your work, and Katrina, all your work, and our contracts people that got these contracts out the out the door and in uh, a way to make sure the money flowed so you could do the work. And it's really been a good exactly. team effort. So. Yeah, and I'll say I'm um, just in closing <clears throat> that you know the um, CBOs and um, and all of us you know are. are take you know are, are doing are good stewards of the resources are trying to maximize the resources that have been invested in us in the community and um, so we're partnering with those CBOs as well and supporting them and again we're like the communication arm mm -hmm. of this and uh, just just so you know that you know my as far as my business you know we have clients you know like Unitas Credit Community Credit Union who has a, a branch here but a lot, a lot of our clients are like Metro Energy Trust of Oregon Portland General Electric um, yeah, we worked with a lot other municipalities, uh, Milwaukee. So, so we've been. This is our specialty area, area and um, and we built a lot of relationships and trust. So I think that we bring that value. And it's in my back. It's in, I'm in you know Woodburn, Marion County. So being here five generations, this is definitely home uh, for our family. So, thank you. Thank you. I'm really grateful. I just wanted to share um, with the tone. I feel like you did a really good job with these, and I wish the governor had hired you. Um, earlier in the in the pandemic um, and I was looking at the data and uh, we have the highest vaccination rate among Latino populations in the state and I think that's a credit to you and your work and it shows that you don't have to beat people or berate people or or threaten people you just have to persuade them and do so in a positive yeah. way so I just yeah. want to thank you for that and thank you for the way that you're you're handling this campaign uh, Commissioner Wilson, thank you. That's, uh, yeah, please call her. <laughs> we'll take another call. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but um, business, business side. But, you know, I will say it's a team effort. Everybody here has um, contributed to it. It's not just, you know, the Latino community. It's, it's other folks. Yeah. And it's been my hats off to Katrina and um, Commission, uh, Chair uh, Cameron because they've been in these meetings with us for, what, over a year and a half now? Yeah. And, um, and I will say, you know, um, it's it's a it's it's more of like you know a, a relationship kind of you looked at this campaign a meet and greet kind of thing, and then asking if they have any questions, providing them information, and then maybe you know getting to a point where you can encourage them to actually take the vaccine. So you know it's all relationship based trust and providing information, and that's what a lot of people want. You know, because a lot of this is fear. Some of it, not not everybody. I can't speak for everybody, but a lot of it is that unknown. And um, so we just try to encourage them along the way so yeah thank you all right good thank job. you so much you you're yeah. good all right
even though the outdoor mask mandate came out, uh, you know, we still have higher numbers than we had a year ago. Um, I mean, we're doing better now, but still this, you know, we, we saw the stats today. We had six more people that attributed their life's loss to COVID. So still uh, um, something that's with us and we need to make sure that we're uh, doing the right precautions as you are right now sanitizing Katrina. And uh, we were just talking about this yesterday about how little flu cases we had last year because probably because of hand washing and sanitizing and masks. So um, I'm looking forward to get, I think I get my booster next week, don't I? Is that what the plan is? Um, I will have to check in with you after the meeting. Okay, I know I gotta get my booster here yes, pretty quick, so uh, <laughs> making sure that I okay. get that done. So she's I, so PC, I love she's, her. She's, she is, right? yeah. yeah. Good job. All right, so we'll move on. Thank you for your presentation. We'll move on to the next presentation, which is, well, and if there's people here for the public hearing that's, that says, uh, 9.30, just so you know, we'll do that at the end of our business. So um, just want to make sure that you're aware of how we do those. I apologize that we, we're going to be probably closer to, oh, probably, uh, probably 15, 20 minutes. We'll get started, I guess. Scott, welcome. Thank you. Yep, so Scott McClure, long-term disaster recovery manager, staff report 12. <coughs> 14 months after the fire, and similar numbers here you saw last time, but I think there's a nice number that we've done really well on. That in other counties is 42% of dwelling permits actually in place. We're seeing some trends now as dropping off of, I think, some of the folks that had more resources to move forward, weather is a consideration too, so I think that'll slow down a little bit and then hopefully pick up again next year. Except pick up to 55. Scott, can you pull the microphone closer, please? Okay. okay. Thank you. you then a hazard tree cleanup, yeah, these are just kind of damaged or kind of irrelevant numbers at this point. But way back when, we thought we were about 67% on property cleanup, and then hazard trees about 74%. Uh, is, is the, the mic, mic off? off? Is the green light on? It appears to be, but I can't tell. Uh -oh. If the green light is on, yeah. you just pull it really close. Okay. You know what? Take your mask off okay. and then pull it really close. Okay. There you go. Any better there? We'll know in a second because they're reporting to us from upstairs. Well, then <laughs> keep talking. Keep talking. Trom will let us know. Okay. okay, and then on to projects. A lot of good work being done. Uh, City of Gates, they're working on new financial software in Arkansas. And we hired to work on financial issues and helping through that process. Still not working. So can you just wait a second. Well, can he, can he uh, take it over to the other chair? Yeah, Scott. There you go. Maybe somebody kicked it underneath. It's on. Oh, okay, it wasn't on. Okay. So why don't you start all over again so we can get this all on the record, all <laughs> right? Okay. There's folks watching. Yeah. Say it exactly <laughs> the way you said it before, right? <laughs> Verbatim. Yeah, okay. We'll give it a whirl. So Scott McClure, long-term disaster there recovery manager. I'm picking it up now, too. So. Mm -hmm. uh, status report number 12, November 24th, uh, 14 months after the fire. And a dwelling permit uh, data, same as last time, but we're up to 42%. Seeing some trends there, it's slowing down a little bit with, you know, some of the people that could build have got through. You got the weather issues coming in right now, so that'll probably shift for a little bit and hopefully pick up again next spring. Uh, septic, very good shape, 55% uh, of permits coming through, so very nice there. And then the cleanup issues, those are like you kind of poor data, but back when they seem to be keeping track of their data, 67% uh, on property cleanup, and then 74% uh, on hazard tree removal. I know I went to uh, Central Oregon last weekend, so got stopped a couple times. Saw the nice crews working out there still, so that's good. Then uh, county-led recovery projects. Uh, we have a consultant working on finances for both cities. They've been focused a little more on Gates right now. Uh, Gates is putting in a new utility system and financial software, and so they're helping them get that set up and procedures in place. Communications team, we're going to see if this works. We got a Saniam recovery website, which has been very much updated and ready to go. So let's see what happens here. Uh oh, it looks like it's going to work. Yay! Yay. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> Connectivity is so good. So what they did is they really broke it down. It's really, really actually very convenient. The really the key that they're tagging on is recover, rebuild, rise, and then everything kind of triggers off of that. So on your first page. 
you just get a basic little bit on the long-term recovery group. That's a private organization, uh, mostly volunteers, you know, working with some foundations, but mostly just committed individuals. And they have their basic mission statement, you know, supporting recovery for the residents, property owners, and organizations, businesses working in the San Diego Canyon region. Come down here, one of the key partners is San Diego Service Integration SIT. Those are our disaster case managers. Learn a little bit about there. And then volunteering, that's really important too because we're trying to get out more volunteers. Right now there's a, a small core group that is up in the canyon almost every weekend just doing tree trimming, debris removal, you know, cutting things, just doing dirt work, whatever it is, but it's a really small group. If we had more individuals just chipping in here and there or you know, a community group, uh, you know, a church group that would come out once in a while would really, really boost the efforts. And then donations, you know, there's been some really great support for the canyon, nowhere near what people need to really fully rebuild. So that's kind of the big area there. And then the partnerships, that just gets down to all the other partners that are, that are working in the canyon. So the key things there is that they go to different sections. So recover, if you hit on that one, that's based on the case management services. That's really the key, letting them know what's there, what the service integration team does. Gives you an idea what case management looks like and then just the partners that are obviously including Marion County. And speaking of that case mm -hmm. manager site, mm -hmm. um, the SIT team is in need of two case managers. So if there's anybody in the community that is interested and passionate about helping, they should reach out to Melissa Bauer, the San Diego Integration team up there, and have a conversation because it's highly needed and we need to be able to get folks home. So apply mm -hmm. today. They can <laughs> call our office and you can connect them up. Yeah, you can yeah. call me, you can send me an email. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's very critical need. Thanks for bringing that up, Commissioner yeah. Bethel. They were actually at a, on the cusp of starting to reduce their getting people into the system that had been on a wait list, and they went the opposite now. They lost a couple people, and now they're actually parking more people on the wait list. And, um, and it's, what they're really looking for is a good person. You can learn the system. If, if you care about people, you can work well with people, apply. You know. Then uh, next one up, uh, rebuild. So you got base under there. Actually, let me go back to the trigger better this way. Yeah, so this goes back to kind of a little bit backwards, things that have been going on for quite a while, but the, the hazardous uh, waste removal, the fire cleanup, uh, gives some information on structures, what the cleanup process looks like. And then, and then one that's really cropped up recently is erosion. We always had those heavier rainstorms at camp recently, and, all, and people are like, uh-oh, you know, yeah, okay, we didn't know if it was gonna happen on our property, it looks like it is, and so. I think that's one that's going to need a lot of extra work. And then on the rise side, that's getting the volunteer opportunities. And so you actually can click on the volunteer opportunities if you want to find something. Um, here's just some example of things that are working on. And um, join the LTRG. And you can, that's one way to help. You can also help with volunteering. Like I said, help with donations. And then once again, keys off of the, the main sponsors that we have. But the nice thing is what we're hoping is over time, um, and then let alone those are the core areas, this is really becomes a central location too for like the news and events. So they'll be keeping track of things coming up, upcoming events, there's a blog there, uh, any newsletters that are coming out. So hopefully what, what it evolves to is that if is no, it's people, there's lots of good sorts of information, hopefully this becomes kind of like the source of information and it's an easy place to kind of a one-stop place to go, so. Any questions there? I think the donation site, the link goes to the San Diego Canyon Wildfire Relief mm -hmm. Fund. Um, but I just want to mention that in addition to that, the United Way of the Mid Willamette Valley also has a donation site mm -hmm. open. Um, and while both efforts are needed, um, they do a little different. Um, execution of the funds to so the United Way, oh good, it is on there. Um, they're working with our team on the Housing Committee for GAP funding, um, which is critical. And they're also helping um, renters, uh, which is something that's critical. So both programs are extremely needed. And so if there's people available that would like to, you know, do a year in giving or something, both of those organizations are 501c3, so you can get a tax write off. And I would encourage you to reach out. Okay. Very good. Good job. All right. Minor. <coughs> okay, well, I will click out of here, go back to the rest of it. And then uh, second fire recovery newsletter that just came out so we got that distributed just recently and then they've also got the long-term recovery group providing support to, to let people know about the website is a big one to get that driver happening there but that the LTRG exists 
Um, they've actually set up a schedule with social media posts where you actually just pre-program them so they just come out you know, on a schedule. Um, so that's doing some nice really work there. Um, on economic impact opportunities analysis, they've got their pretty much the good picture of the canyon. Now they're working for really where those recommendations go forward with economic recovery. And then otherwise housing, uh, they kind of reiterate you've got the lease approved for the Gates housing site and then they're starting to work on the septic design and trying to look at those issues. And then the health impact assessment, uh, OSU team had really good participation. They had an online survey and then they had a couple of focus groups, one virtual, one in person, had a, a good participation, that's helping them out with their work. And then on the community envisioning plans, just this last week, they held uh, virtual sessions and then one was a hybrid and Gates uh, tested their findings. So they took all the comments, everything they've learned, tested findings and then they'll move toward getting that finalized. Then um, other thing kind of moving forward, the, uh, we had a consultant coordination meeting that Regional Solutions has been supporting. So that's the consultants saying where they are. We also have a slot for me to give basic information, the LTRG chipped in, and then there's a bunch of federal and state staff keeping track of what our efforts are. Uh, we had a couple canyon tours this week, and they had one which is uh, students from uh, RARE program, which is resource assistant for rural environments. They came from all over the state, uh, got a tour there. And then we also had a group from a California called After the Fire, which as it sounds is an advocacy group now for fire impacted areas. And a uh, consistent comment when they came through, they're like, wow, what a great effort. And they said, wow, what we found out here, we need to come up here and do a more thorough case study on Marion County's response to the fire and how that went. Uh, one that'll help down the road is we actually received an award from the EPA and uh, FEMA for a comprehensive wildfire recovery plan. So what that is, is essentially takes all the current efforts that we're doing, uh, kind of known activity, future projects, and also products from the different studies that we're doing right now, and then winding that all into a, a plan. And so I can give like a couple, you know, like a one or two year plan, potentially just more projects that'll come from there, get a nice organized sense there. So it's technical assistance, so what they'll do is, They'll clarify what our needs are, then get the right consultants that'll work with us to develop that plan. And then a big one uh, coming up is uh, December 7th. You actually get the final product from all these studies that have been going on. That'll be a joint meeting with uh, yourself and the Lynn County Commissioners. And then uh, just kind of a last note, um, kind of as I do a last report here, um, one thing that's been completely consistent the entire time regarding Marion County's response is how good it's been. It only praise. I have heard nothing but praise from citizens, local governments, people in the county, state organizations, FEMA, nonprofits. Every time anything comes up about Marion County, and, and a lot of it's just random. I probably should write them down every time it happens. But I'm just in a meeting and somebody says. But, but just, just to reiterate that, just, you know, I've, I've been in it you know, less time than you have, but in my time, all it's ever been is Marion County's did it right. Marion County did it. Marion County's leading on this issue. Good job, Marion County. And I have to say, it's been really nice to be part of. So, thank you. Thank you. Well, so Scott says in his final report, because he's leaving us on Friday, I don't know if the rest of it's public, but um, this has been a hard year, and you've done a lot of buttoning up and a lot of, of coordinating of a lot of really important things. And so, thanks for what you've done and for that feedback. We were at AOC last week, and uh, of course, the Association of Oregon Counties, for the folks that don't know what that is, and the other counties across the state were present. And of course, we had five counties impacted by wildfires last year. And I talked to um, commissioners in all those counties. And although some are doing different things in progress, kind of the way we're doing things, we just have such a very unique uh, geographic um, region of the state that is impacted. And I couldn't be more proud of the team that we have here at Marion County and all the partners, everybody that you just listed and the citizens for showing up. Um, every time there's a challenge, there's a, a, a gob of people that kind of wrap around it to find a quick solution. Uh, and that get to yes mentality is just rampant throughout our region. And I, it's, it's humbling to be in a space with other folks who are experiencing similar challenges and hear them ask, how are you doing that? Or why did you go that direction? And uh, just to be able to say repeatedly, because it's the Marion County way, it's how we do things. We take care of our neighbors here and uh, you're a valuable part of that. So. Yeah. I know we'll be working with yeah. you in your next <coughs> adventure, so. Yeah, and just, just a one that I've just kind of a, a note to, I think it's interesting gap that Marion County addressed in the system is small organizations. 
um, even down to like the towns of Talent and Phoenix, which you don't really consider tiny, they're struggling because they don't have enough people to do anything. Yeah. And, and the case here, if Marion County had stepped back and said, Gates, Detroit, you're on your own, <laughs> um, it'd be bad. Yeah, it, it, I, I'd look at it as actually potentially a flaw really in the FEMA system. I mean, they should really know when you're going into these microscopic cities that they're going to need more help. But you guys identified it. You went to the state and the state said, yes, we will help. So with that partnership, that's really where a lot of this is getting going. And we've had a, very much an acceleration here in recovery. Well, in this this week, we've gotten some emails from folks who um, have gotten their property tax refunds for the 10 months that they couldn't use their homes after they were burned. And I want to give you, Commissioner Cameron, a lot of credit for that and Barb Young. Um, so I remember at the beginning, we talked, it was one of the hardest things that I had to do as a commissioner was um, send out property tax notices to people whose homes had just <coughs> burned because they burned in September. And then we sent out property tax notices in October or November. And um, man, that was that was a really hard thing. I remember that work session where, where Tom came in and said, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to you know, we're required by statute to send out these property tax statements. Um, and uh, and immediately I remember I talked to the governor that day or that week and, and I said, hey, this is a problem. You know, these folks don't, don't have anything and they need this money to rebuild. Um, would you help us get this relief? And she said yes at the time. But going from that yes to actually getting the relief and people, <laughs> he has the scars to prove it. Um, Kevin really worked incredibly hard. Sorry, Commissioner Cameron worked incredibly hard. Um, Kevin's fine. With Barb <laughs> to make that happen. And so, it, yeah, and, and through the legislature. For folks that don't know, I mean, yeah. it was like a battle through the legislature and a tug of war at times to get it done. Yeah. yeah. It's just, I bet, being, having spent nine and a half years there, I understand the battle and it just, you just got to stay at it. But um, yeah, uh, I received, I showed you my letters. I, yeah. I received my checks. I, I said I didn't want them, but I yeah. received my checks because. I guess from according to our assessor, that's the process. They just have to do it. So um, I'm going to donate mine back to either Wildfire Relief or United Way's Wildfire um, uh, because I said I, I want to do this, but I don't want to have any conflict, right? This right. isn't about me getting my property taxes back because I live in Detroit. But um, yeah, it was a great it was a great team effort, and <clears throat> we just wish we would have got the League of Oregon Cities on our team, and we would have had a, a much much smoother <laughs> process. <There's> nothing <coughs> crazier than seeing the League of Oregon Cities lobby against it's, Detroit and yeah, against and their Mill own City people. in, uh, in and, the legislature. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. the craziest thing I ever saw. I think it's, so, it's nice though to say, just to touch on those letter the emails. So we've gotten a few emails, as Commissioner Willis had said, in regards to those tax relief um, checks that they received, and Everybody in it, aside from the fact that they express their surprise, and we've been talking about this, it's like for a year this has been a conversation, but people don't really understand um, what, what it meant until they received the check in the mail. And the one that we received yesterday uh, started out with... From uh, Janice? No, that was a couple days ago. Uh, it was, um, Happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas. This, is, this brings my family joy, and it, it fills a need that we had that we didn't know existed. And I, aside from the fact that we're helping them recover. This county just also showed up in their family's emotional space during the holiday season and I think that that's uh, it just it goes miles and of course it took a year because that's how it takes in government but I'm really proud of this county and everything they've done and the assessor's department the office assessor's office for even doing getting it done it was yeah. a, not a small feat. Oh Tom and his team did a phenomenal job. Yeah. yeah we couldn't have done it without them. Yeah creating something new in government is always difficult. We're going to miss you. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we're going to see on the 7th. You're going to sure, get us all the information. <laughs> I'm sure that, I'm sure the, uh, is it public where you're going? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm fine. sure yeah, the so, city of yeah. Turner will benefit from your presence. It's not very presence. far. Yeah. 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 Marion County. Yeah, yeah, Danielle yeah. says we're going to lose you, and I'm well, like, I think this is great. We're yeah. going to have a good partner in one of our cities. Yeah. And uh, da David has been, I, I remember David Sawyer has been their city manager since I, uh, 2004 or five, I think he I think so. got there. It's about when I got to the legislature. He uh, has done a great job, and you're going to get a, a neat little city handed off to you. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, it's, we'll, it's it's a nice town, nice we'll, diversity, got good things going on, and 
And it has the best chicken fried steak in Oregon. <laughs> the turnaround? Or? It, it, the turn, yeah, the turnaround okay. cafe. Okay. Their meatloaf well, sandwiches. My friend Carlos runs the kitchen there. I, I, I can specifically attest to the fact that it is the best. I've had because I, I go on weekly or monthly journeys for fine chicken fried steak and bloody okay. Mary. Have so. you had? Have you had? The words chicken fried steak. I have like filet mignon. Yeah, I, it's not wow. as good. Okay, wow. let's, we we uh, this we need to get back. This to got business. Let's go. All right, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank Appreciate you. it. Okay. If we had a decent chair, he'd keep us on track. It's a holiday. All right. Um, Whose turn is it for consent calendar this week? I think it Probably might be hers. Mine. Yeah, go for it. We're gonna make What's it yours. Calendar look like. It's there's only three moments. It's three <laughs> items. It's definitely. It's yours. a really short week. All right, Mr. Chair, I move to approve the consent calendar. Item number one under finance. Actually, excuse me, item number four under finance. Approve six quick claim deeds for the sale of six foreclosed properties from Marion County to grantees Vera Yocub tax account number ID. Oh, Tax here. account ID numbers 108094, number 108095, number 108096, and number 108098 and 108099 and to grantees Arthur Borshawa and Edelina Borshawa tax account ID number 108097. Item 5 under public works approve an order adopting the Marion County Surveyor's Office Map Standards and Plat Naming Policy and item 6 under Treasurer's Office approve an order distributing Oregon State Forestry timber revenue in the amount of two million eighty five thousand five hundred eighty five dollars and twenty cents as per ORS chapter 530. And I'll second the motion. Yeah, motion a second to approve the consent calendar. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Chair asks unanimous consent to return to public comment Without because, objection. like the flag salute, <laughs> yeah. I forgot about it. Yeah. This is this is one of those uh, one of those days. It's Thanksgiving. I can't wait to eat turkey tomorrow. Um, we have nobody signed up for public comment, but I do want to make an announcement that if you're here. Uh, for the public hearing, you don't need to sign up for public comment. You can sign up for the public hearing. But if you want to talk about any other subjects, uh, this would be the time to sign up for public comment. So far, we have Noni signed up. All right, good. Then we'll move on to uh, uh, that completes our, because we have no action items, so the chair will open a public hearing to consider zone change comprehensive plan amendment ZC CP case number 21-00 Jordan Schweiger Lindsay King staff Lindsay welcome happy Thanksgiving week to you happy Thanksgiving good morning good morning commissioners for the record this is Lindsay King Marion County planning the nice item mask Thank you. Thank you. Channeling my inner Joe. <laughs> I don't have any ties, so. <laughs> the item before you today is an application to change the comprehensive plan designation from developing residential to multifamily residential and to change the zone from urban development to multifamily residential on a 0.44 acre lot located at 4683 Center Street, Northeast Salem. The property is located on the north side of Center Street, approximately 0.6 miles from uh, east of Lancaster Drive. Properties directly to the north and east are zoned single family residential and within Salem city limits. Properties to the south and west are zoned urban development and within the county jurisdiction. All surrounding properties are currently developed with single family homes, duplexes, and one with a church, which is across Center Street. The planning division requested comments from various governmental agencies. These comments are located in the staff memo and file for reference. The hearings officer conducted a public hearing on August 19th of this year and on October 5th of this year issued a recommendation that the board approve the request. The hearings officer found that the applicant satisfied all the relevant approval criteria for a comprehensive plan amendment and a zone change. The applicant is seeking both a comprehensive plan amendment and zone change, and the zone change is dependent upon obtaining the comprehensive plan amendment. Therefore, if the applicant fails to obtain the comprehensive plan amendment, it cannot obtain a pro uh, proposed zone change. Beginning on page four of the recommendation, the hearings officer discusses the applicable comprehensive plan policies and zone change criteria, and concluded that the policies and criteria are met 
and recommends approval of the request subject to conditions listed in the hearings officer report. The board has the options of continuing the public hearing, close the hearing and leave the record open, close the hearing and approve, modify or deny the request, or they can remand it back to the, back to the hearings officer. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions for Lindsay at this time? No. Commissioner? No. Okay. Good. I just want to make one more announcement. Uh, I have a sign up sheet here for um, testimony. Uh, I have three individuals on here. If there's anybody who has not signed up that would like to make uh, testimony, I uh, want to make sure you have the opportunity to do that. I will call up the first person on the list. Well, actually, um, this, no, this is proponents, the applicant's uh, time. So um, I'm not sure, I, I see Jordan on here. I see him as the applicant. So Jordan, are you wanting to testify at this time or do you have representation that you're gonna have? I have representation. So, okay, so that is who? Brittany Randall. Brittany, yeah, do you wanna come up and? Uh, here or here? On the right side, okay. please, my right. <clears throat> Hot seat before. <laughs> well, I don't know how hot it is, but <laughs> actually, I'm chilled, so I think you're fine. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Welcome, Brittany, and if you'll introduce yourself for the record. Okay. Yes. Thank you. For the record, my name is Brittany Randall of Brand Land Use. Um, do you require an address for the record? Uh, go ahead. Okay. Yes. It's 12150 Jefferson Highway, 99E Southeast in Jefferson. Um, I plan to keep my presentation short, but wanted to highlight a few specific points for your consideration today. Um, first, there's two jurisdictions at play here as we're proposing to amend the City of Salem's comprehensive plan in Marion County zone. Um, of course, with the intergovernmental agreement in place, the deciding body is you, the county commissioners. Uh, however, we believe it's still important to have support of city staff, which this case does. In a memorandum dated August 2nd, 2021, addressed to Ryan Dyer, who's no longer with us, darn it. Um, the City of Salem staff states that they are supportive of the zone change and comprehensive plan amendment. Um, and as Lindsay stated, we also have recommendation from both Marion County staff and the county hearings officer that this case be approved. Um, this property is the very definition of an enclave. The subject property and the property directly to the west owned by Mr. Flowers are the only two parcels on this side of Center Street which have yet to be annexed into the city of Salem in the um, immediate vicinity. In order to connect to water and sewer services needed to serve the proposed development in the future, the app applicant will be required to connect to, or I'm sorry, to annex into the city of Salem. Um, and those discussions have already started with the city. Um, the other thing we wanted to point out is that multifamily developments should be located within the UGB for many reasons. Providing density within the city UGBs allows for orderly development, prevents sprawl, and really protects um, our county inventory lands for agricultural use. Um, Multifamily developments should be located where they have direct access to services, such as public transportation or within walking distance to shopping um, and employment, entertainment, um, and things like that. This property meets all of those desires as it's just a couple of blocks from Lancaster Drive Corridor. The property also fronts a major chariot's route, so that's a great opportunity for an apartment dweller to have access, direct access to our public transportation system in Salem. Um, we would like to note that the code addresses an appropriate way to transition from lower density to higher density residential uses by imposing more cumbersome setbacks on the multifamily development. So the applicant will be required to set back all portions of their development 20 feet from all property lines abutting the RS zone. Um, between the small scale of the proposal, the large setbacks, the screening and landscaping requirements, uh, we believe the single family uses will be well buffered from the small scale multifamily development. During the initial comment period, a comment was made that there is multifamily land across Center Street and once it's developed, it should help fulfill 
Salem's need for multifamily residential land. And we just wanted to note for your record that the multifamily land across the street is already zoned and inventoried appropriately for multifamily development. So therefore it's already been counted and the city of Salem still has a significant deficit in multifamily lands. And to be more specific, in 2015, I'm sorry, 2014, the city conducted a housing needs analysis along with the Salem economic opportunities analysis. The purpose of the HNA was to develop strategies to provide enough land to meet Salem's housing needs through 2035 and inform policy decisions related to residential land. Um, and the HNA found the following, that Salem has a projected 1,975 acres surplus of land for single family detached housing and a projected 207 acre deficit of land for multifamily housing, which equates to 2,897 dwelling units. That's all I have for you, unless you have questions for me. Questions for uh, Ms. Rand or, uh, Ms. Randall, right? No. Questions? No. Good. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. It's all good. Um, uh, next on the list, uh, Jordan, did you want to uh, testify you're on here in support of? Sure. Welcome. Thank you. Just introduce yourself for the record. My name is Jordan Schweiger. I am the property owner. And um, I just wanted to say that um, just speak in favor of the project. It is from a um, from a code perspective, um, and from meeting statewide planning goals, and from you know a technical aspect, Brittany's addressed that. I just wanted to say that I also believe that this makes sense um, from from the neighborhood perspective. It is across the street from multifamily property. What will eventually be multifamily property. Um, it will serve the area well. It's it's proximate to Lancaster, and um, it it is a, an appropriate buff, buffer between um, the higher traffic street of, of uh, Center Street and um, residential properties to the north. And so when we looked at this and how to best serve Salem, there's a lot of families who want to be in the area um, who are looking for a place to be, and this provides much needed housing and a lot of families um, need that that sort of housing product and as we looked at it we thought it'd be more appropriate um, than just doing single family homes uh, there at the street we looked at both options originally when we were um, considering purchasing the property and we just felt like this would be be better for Salem it would put more people into um, housing product that isn't as Brittany said very short supply so that's it for me okay Good to see you. Thank okay. you. Thanks. All right. Thank Any you. questions? No. No. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, Tom's Tom. Mr. Flowers. Good morning. Good morning. Just introduce yourself for the record, please. My name is Tom C. Flowers, and I'm a property owner next door to. Can you pull that microphone a little closer for the record? Thank you. There you go. Uh, good morning. My name is Thomas C. Flowers II, and I'm a property owner at 4643 Center Street, directly east of the said property. Um, I've been in Salem a long time. Oh, I moved here in 95. And it's been a good area, and Marion County has been good to me. And at first, I was really opposed to this because there's going to be a potential of four people in each dwelling, and that's 48 people driving my driveway that was a shared driveway. Then when I bought my place, I thought it was supposed to stay single family. Also, I thought I was going to be able to remain Marion County, but I found out I'm going to be forced to annex into the city of Salem irregardless which will up my taxes. This may be an opportunity for me in long term to have this place next door 
because it'll make mine viable for a multifamily to just fill that little area right there. All the other homes face different parts of the street. They have their boundary and they don't have to worry about the entry or that busy street that's in front of me. So I came to the first meeting and I opposed it and I'm here to retract that based on this may give me an opportunity to get out in the country long term. Can I? Yeah. I have a question. Are you done? Are you done with your testimony? Because Commissioner Willis has a question. Is that okay? Oh, absolutely. Anything. Yeah. Commissioner Willis. Um, why are you going to be forced into annexing the city of Salem? Well, I understood that that happened in 2026 is what, well, I didn't look it up myself. Actually, it was a neighbor that there was before me told me that. I haven't researched it myself, so am I wrong? Would you prefer not to be annexed in the city of Salem? Well, it saves my taxes by like 66%. Yeah. Okay, because I'm opposed to people being forced into annexation to the city of Salem. So I just want to make sure. Well, I'd like to know more about that because if there's something that. This is only what I, can I was do to told, sir. I, I actually did not do my own research, so okay. I'm guilty there of that. Okay. But that's what I'd heard, and so with that in mind, then I thought, well, maybe this is the opportunity because if that one's multi, then that one would be easy to make multi yep. because we have really good neighbors there. I have really good neighbors to my north. I knew all my neighbors when I moved in. I went and introduced myself because I planned on being there a long time. But I personally am not going to be real happy with having a bunch of families around. But if it will help me sell my property and get me out in the country where I'd rather be anyway, then this might be the opportunity for that. What would your preference be? Would you prefer to stay here if you don't get annexed and if you don't have an apartment next to you, or would you prefer to get annexed, have an apartment next to you and, and move? Well, my main concern was the driveway, sir, is because it's a shared driveway being two single dwellings and it's not built. But Jordan said he would flop his plan and put the driveway on the other side. So, you know, it's really hard for a person to fight progress. And I would prefer to be in the country personally. And like I said, I think this might be the opportunity for me to get there. So just to clarify, this, is, this, this hearing has nothing to do with the city of Salem annexing your property or this property. Well, I mean, they're signing an agreement with the city of Salem, which impacts their property. But um, we don't know about anything that the city of Salem is going to annex your property. And uh, we, as a board, we have done everything we can to just make sure that we're taking care of East Salem residents and if that happens because of some law or something that happens out in the future obviously we will try to do everything we can to prevent the annexation but I want to come back to the the, the facts of this particular issue it's not about the annexation uh, of your property and I appreciate you coming here and saying hey I, I can't fight progress but you can um, and that the fact that you're seeing some value to this in your neighborhood potentially for your long-term benefit I, I appreciate you coming forward mr. mr. flowers and, and talking about that so um, is there any other questions that that we have for mr. flowers no, no? Thanks for coming. thank you and and thank you for uh, really assessing the whole uh, the whole issue and uh, we really appreciate um, do you want to ask him about the city of uh, New Marion no. <laughs> He's kidding. I yeah. do have, actually do have a question, uh, Mr. Flowers. <clears throat> so, um, <coughs> what are your thoughts on having single, having this property developed and adding additional single family units? So, single homes. If there was another home. What's that? If they just built a singular home there. They can put up to can, four, yeah. right? Is that under under even if it's his own single family, they can put I think a duplex, a triplex. Can they put? Four, Lindsay, or just three? Um, Under our single family. Why don't, we have, <clears throat> why don't we have? Okay. Uh, if we if we want to ask questions to staff, we can have. Uh, we'll have her come back up. I th actually, Lindsay, why don't you? To yeah, just go ahead. Go ahead and stay there. Stay. Excuse me. <laughs> go ahead. Stay right there. Staff's going to be right here. All Thank right. you. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, Lindsay King. For the record, could you repeat the question? How many under under our single family zoning code? You can put multiple units 
on a piece of property. Well, this is UD, but but we we said we wanted townhomes and duplexes to be allowed on our single family zone. Currently, right. duplexes are only allowed on corner lots, okay. so this would not qualify okay. for a duplex. They what about the townhome? They could put uh, one townhome. They would have to go through some uh, subdivision or partition to and how many obtain units? the smaller how many, lots. Three units? Uh, or four? For a partition is three, yes, at I believe 4,000 square feet. So they could put th up to three units as is currently zoned without it being rezoned? The... I would have to look into, I don't have my code book in front of me. Okay. Uh, so I would have to look that up to double check. Okay. But I guess that's the question, right? Commissioner? Yeah, the question is, is that is, I mean, would this be a burden to you or a challenge to your driveway if it was a, something other than multifamily units, apartments, if it was to become townhomes or duplexes or in fact, single family homes? Because as the record states, um, we do need single family housing all across Marion County. I understand what you're going there, I believe. And to me, more than one, I mean, I didn't even like sharing the driveway with the gentleman that was there, but he was old and I helped him build a circle driveway in front and he used that and he was never down that driveway and I paid for the asphalt and having it built. So long story short, yes, I, I'm opposed to any dwelling over. I had had a handshake to build by the property, but I didn't get it and I'm not trying to be mean to nobody. but. Any families over with a shared driveway or a pain. You know, it, you're very fortunate if you end up with good neighbors, which I have. Okay, thank but you. But this really gives me opportunity, I think, to get out of the country because then that my property could be zone multi and those two could go together and other people will have their houses face different directions, hopefully aren't bothered too much. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good. Anything else? Any other questions? No. Your, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to call Lindsay's already here, so I'm going to call Lindsay back up. She's here. Any other questions for staff? I'm surprised to hear that we can only do duplexes on corner lots in the county. Is that a part of the conversation that we had earlier this spring to adjust? It is. It is. So in the single family zone, a duplex is allowed only on a corner lot subject to specific standards. Um, in the multifamily zone, a duplex is allowed outright. Um, so you can have, it doesn't have to be on a corner lot. I did drive by the neighborhood on my way out this morning and there are quite a few duplexes not on corner lots in the area. I don't know how those were created, probably prior to the single family zone standard, okay. but um, they, they are allowed uh, as part of the multifamily proposal as well. Um, okay. So they're not, in they're not locked into doing apartments or townhomes. They can do duplexes or lower densities if they'd like. Okay. Yeah, Thank so the, it's a conditional use under UD to do a duplex. Two, right, or two family shared housing. I'm looking at the UD code right oh, now. Oh, yeah, if it's, I don't have that code in front of me, so, right. but um, it sounds familiar. And then we also gave direction to allow more development, like several months ago. And you guys are working on code revisions. We are, yes. Right? And do you remember what that, those code revisions are? Not off the top of my head. It's, it's been quite a, quite a while and a little bit of a busy season for us. So I've got a, a lot of stacks of papers <coughs> to go through regarding that. But uh, I, I do believe we did get direction from the board to continue on with that. And townhomes are also allowed, I know, in, because we talked about this in that meeting. In the single family zone or the yes. multifamily zone? Or UD, which zone? Well, I don't know. Okay, we'll move on. Yeah, we'll have okay. to follow up. Yeah, yeah. this, this is probably a discussion for. Yeah, let me stick to the facts of this case. All right. Any other questions about this particular case? <coughs> no. Okay. Somebody want to make a motion? No, we have, don't we have more testimony? Nope. Oh, no, that's it. Nobody else has signed up. Oh, well, I... Huh? They didn't have, they came in late because the, we were told the meeting was 9.30, but they came in and didn't get the time. Would you like to sign, would you like to, I'm sorry, because I announced it twice. Would you like to sign up, no, testify? No, I, I don't have anything relevant to add. I objected to the change of the Do, Would you like to come yeah, for the record? Yeah, you'll need to say that on the record. Come up for the record. Here. I thought we were uh, 
a confusing process, even for uh, me. <clears throat> And we're going to have you come over here uh, and then, yeah, go ahead and sign up and then Brenda can bring that back. Uh, good morning. Mr. Kamadi, uh, just introduce yourself for the record, please. Yes. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ronald Comedy. My wife and I uh, live at 755 Moonflower Street Northeast. We adjoined the property on its uh, north side. And our concerns that we expressed in the hearing were that we felt there would be a loss of privacy for us when it jumped from having a single family unit there to having 12 dwelling units, which was what was indicated in the uh, proposal. And we viewed it as a loss of privacy, increased noise, and a general detriment to our property. I did not I was not familiar enough with the process to include a lot of specifics in my opposition. Uh, what we are hoping for in coming to the meeting today was to find out more about how the development would occur and how much setback, whether, you know, how much privacy screening and the general effect on our property. Uh, we are surrounded currently by single family dwellings and we bought into that area on purpose to be in a single family neighborhood. So we found the change to be upsetting to go into apartment units. But we've really uh, have worked with Chuck or Mr. Flowers on his use of his property and our use of our property so there wouldn't be any problems with the neighbors. And as I said, our, our general concern was just the change that was occurring. So that was our objection. Questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I'm not clear. Are you still opposing this or not? We would prefer not to have a large complex next door to us. Uh, we'd prefer single family units, and that's the basis of our objection, just having a multi-family unit next to us. We've lived in apartment complexes before, obviously, uh, long time Salem residents, long time Oregon residents. And in the Portland area, I, we lived in an apartment complex and didn't enjoy the uh, experience. So that is why we objected to this. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, and, and I will just make the comment about uh, what it would actually look like. This is just a zone change, and at that point in time where the project would be, if the zone changes, uh, 
approved when the project is developed that's when all those details would be um, designed as far as setbacks and what it looks like etc in the neighborhood so today's not not about that but this would be strictly about his own change so I appreciate your concern and your um, your citizenship and living in that particular area and uh, mr. Fowler's as well so we appreciate that as we move forward thank you very much for being here today and coming coming to to talk to us about it we appreciate okay. that. thank you very much mr. Uh, question Maybe for, for you or for the legal counsel or maybe for Lindsay. Well, I'm going to have, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to ask the proponents to come back up and if they have anything else to say, um, just following the procedures yep. of a public hearing. Thank you. Um, and then we can have Lindsay come back up. <clears throat> Uh, for the record, this is Brittany Randall with Brand Land Use again. Um, so we can certainly understand not wanting to see our neighborhoods change and moving into an area expecting it to stay sort of status quo. Um, but all of our HNAs suggest that this housing type is needed. Um, the property owner can speak more to what he anticipates the future development to look like. But in our discussions, we have spoken about um, developing it in a manner that it appears to look like townhomes in order to fit more aesthetically into the, the community and the neighborhood. Um, you've heard some testimony that there are, though we don't know how, there are duplexes in the area. Um, so I think everything points to the fact that the community could actually really benefit from this. Um, as far as the setbacks, we'll be developing to City of Salem standards. So um, abutting a single family zone, there's a minimum 20 foot setback, six foot side obscuring fence, and heavy, heavy landscaping requirements. Um, so I think that you'll see actually a huge benefit and a boost in the area with this brand new beautiful development, new landscaping, new fence, et cetera. Um, but I think Jordan can speak more specifically to what he anticipates the the building actually looking like, but um, the city of Salem does require articulation, so it won't be just a big, fat, rectangular building um, that I think a lot of people uh, imagine when they think of an apartment complex. So um, it'll be small scale, it'll fit in nicely with the, the surrounding residences. Um, and as far as uh, being able to put townhomes on this property with within the single family zone, I think that's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. I'm part of your uh, Marion County Planning Commission, and I haven't seen that come through for us to make a recommendation to the board, but I would be delighted to look at that further and work with my fellow commissioners on that. Of course, that's for another day, but for the record, I'd be excited to look at that. <laughs> Do you have any questions for me? Nope. Good? Okay. okay. Lindsay, I think maybe Commissioner Bethel has a question. Oh, by the way, and just uh, in uh, Ms. Randall's presentation, she mentioned HNAs as an acronym, Housing Needs Analysis, in case anybody was wondering what that meant. Lindsay. Lindsay King, for the record. Thank you. So my question really is a procedural question. So if this, when a zone change occurs, let's say that it's approved today, what's the process, the formal process, once a proposed development comes to your department for um, the community's interaction or awareness or education? So if this specific project uh, were to be approved for the comprehensive plan amendment and zone change, uh, depending on what the applicant wishes to do with the property, uh, it, it varies. So if they want to do the multifamily development that was suggested in the application, they're gonna have to annex into the city for services. Um, there's, and that was something that was in the uh, City of Salem comments um, that it'll be required to be annexed to, to get the sewer water, um, or at least the sewer. Um, and so then I believe the City of Salem would notify neighbors of, of that annexation. I'm not entirely sure of the City of Salem's uh, process for development, but as far as Marion County goes, if they wanted to do the development and they didn't need to connect to services, for example, they would just come in for building permits. There's no notification to the neighbors. Um, it's just as it is. 
Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't have any questions. Okay. Some comments. Go ahead. So, are we ready to deliberate on this? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to support this. Um, I, I don't support, uh, I have a couple of comments on this. We had something similar last week, um, and my concern is protecting single family zoning. Um, there's a movement to eliminate single family zoning. Um, I don't think that's good. I, I think if the city of Salem or if we have an obligation to make more land available for multifamily, it should be a thought out process. It shouldn't be um, somebody can buy a piece of land that's zoned single family and then we the commissioners rezone it because I think there's an expectation interest and a reliance interest at play there because um, as the neighbors said, they bought into a single family zone um, and that's part of what they knew when they bought their house. And also the developer bought into a single family zone and that's part of what you knew, Jordan, when you bought that house. And so um, I am concerned about that and I don't think that if there's a need for multifamily, it should fall on uh, the community equally. It shouldn't fall on specific people individually. And so um, I, I, I don't support basically this one-off rezoning from single family to multifamily. Um, I also think home ownership's really important and it's lost in the conversations about housing. And so um, this would result in taking land that's zoned to be uh, owned by somebody and to be uh, a home that they live in and they own and it's going to turn into a rental unit. So um, I think we have multiple needs and and uh, and I don't think the right way to build more multifamily is is to basically take out single family zoned property. So that's how I'm going to vote today. Well, I, I will say um I respect those comments. Um, I don't know that there was anything in here that said these would be rental units. They, they said they would be townhomes, which I, my first home was a townhome, was 925 square feet. In Diamond Bar, California, I remember that, and uh, it was the way I got started. So um, it was also, uh, you know, there was single family homes in the neighborhood around it. Um, I, I do know that our housing needs not only in the state of Oregon, but in Marion County are far behind what we need. And we, uh, we've got to find ways to find entry level housing for people to get off the streets and, uh, or the person that's just starting out in a new job. And so, um, you know, we don't know what this, this project's gonna look like, but I would assume that at the, at the point it was developed, it would, it would be a, a, an addition, a new construction uh, with some nice things and an opportunity, and I don't know whether whether the applicant plans to just rent them out or to uh, sell them, and that would be their choice at the time they would do it. Just like if they built single-family homes, they could keep them as rentals or sell them. They have a choice to do that. So I'm going to support this um, this change today, and uh, it's up to you, Commissioner. Thank you. So this, this is, it's an interesting time, and I agree, you can't, it's difficult to fight progress, but I, but I believe that you can. And one of the things that I have said since uh, I, I was asked to run for the seat and ran and have been here is that I, I do believe in home ownership. And actually just yesterday I had a, a two hour long meeting upstairs with our CDBG manager and our home manager, which is a program that we're facilitating here for, um, for housing. And we're focusing as a commission, it appears, on home ownership and the ability for people to be stabilized in their homes in home ownership. And I'm not going to support this today because I believe it's simply what it says here. As the hearing officer stated, um, this proposed finding, because it did not address how removing single family dwellings would be consistent with projected need for single family housing. We do need single family housing. It's a priority uh, for families and for individuals, and I believe that the rate that housing is being developed and the cost of that is unfortunate, and it, and it, it costs people out of the ability to own homes as a first-time home buyer. And I would encourage uh, developers to be creative with their development and create uh, single-family home ownership opportunities so people can really further their lives um, through, that, through that process. So, um, 
I can't support this because I believe specifically what it says here. It's just, it's, it is zoned single family. Um, it, I believe it should stay that way. I wouldn't want apartments or high any of that type in my backyard either. And I, I, I so th that's just where I'm at. Okay. I'll make a motion that we close the public hearing and deny the request. I second the motion. Well, I'm going to oppose the motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, nay. Okay, so I will close the public hearing. And uh, who's reading the calendar? I think I am. You're reading the calendar. Hey, Mr. Chair. Thank you everybody for being here today. Thank you. It's November 24th. It's 9 in the morning, and we're here for our board session in the Senator hearing room at 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem. At 1.15 this afternoon, we have a BOC CIO meeting with an executive session if needed pursuant to ORS 192.6602 ABDEFHI, located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. Tomorrow is Thursday, November 25th, and uh, we are closed in observance of Thanksgiving. On Monday, November 29th at 2.45 in the afternoon, we have a work session regarding our Community Development Block Grant Program located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. And then on Tuesday, November 30th at 9 uh, in the morning, we have a board retreat located at the Grand Hotel here in Salem. That's 201 Liberty Street Southeast in Salem. And then Wednesday, December 1st at 9 in the morning, we have a board session located in the center hearing room, the first floor of this building. It's 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem. And then on December 1st, Wednesday at noon, we have a Woodburn Marion County meeting located at the Metropolis, 347 North Front Street in Woodburn. And on Wednesday, December 1st at 1.15 in the afternoon, we have a BOCCO meeting with an executive session if needed pursuant to ORS 192.6602 ABDEFHI, located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. And then on Wednesday, December 1st at 4 in the afternoon, we have a FEMA briefing for local officials located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. And happy Thanksgiving. All right, anything else? Go Beavers. Go <laughs> Beavers. Oh. I have to, tonight I'll be making a fair amount of, I, I, you know, I, I'm like a day late and a dollar short. I was gonna bring you guys my famous apple pizza pie today so you could enjoy it. I know Ooh, that the Willises have had it. I took it to them oh, last yes, year. Sure apple pizza <laughs> pie. It's phenomenal. It's my grandma's wow. recipe. It's like your fish and tacos. Maybe I'll, you know what, I'll bring it to DHEO. Cause we're gonna have I a, won't be there. Well then, Fine. I, I got to be at the airport at 2.30, so. For DHEO? Like, it's that not today. Week? It's in a couple of weeks. We have like a like a DHEO a party? Like party party? banquet or something. Oh, oh, oh I was thinking of I, today's sorry. meeting. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Yes, All today right. you're going to go pick up your gal and bring her home and have Thanksgiving and watch the beavers and cheer That's proudly. It. Eat lots of food. The lake. Yep. And I just want to note for the record that legal counsel over here did, in fact, wear a beaver's lanyard. So... Good job. Well, he always does. <laughs> he does. I mean, he's, he's, yeah. He said, he's I didn't wear my tie. Unlike, unlike you and I, he's quiet about it, though. Right? He, I, he I have to, he's consistent, to though. I say this for Scott. Scott is the most consistent Beavers fan. Like, you guys are the loudest, but like every day, Scott's, you know, repping the colors. I just am going to say that uh, Chad Ball really needs to make sure next year Commissioner Cameron is on it for this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well,. Sam and I used to communicate about it, and I don't know I why. I almost text I, you, I, and I, I thought he doesn't need me to mom I him today. I don't know why I forgot about it until I walked in and saw the bright yellow sweatshirt on one of our employees. It's like that's okay. great. It's going to be a great game. I hope everybody tunes in. It was just announced that it starts at six, like six oh five or something on Saturday. Um, oh, I heard it was twelve thirty. Really? Oh, yeah. I got it. Well, good they to know. They announced, or I told my girls, I said that, because my girls all come up with my grandsons. And I we better all, look really quick, because I have, someone sent me a text. Yeah. And okay, well, picture. we'll we'll handle that <laughs> offline, but I don't think no, that. No, you make can, sure you sure. find out and watch. Yeah. You can trust us for public policy, maybe not when the Beavers game. Is. Hey, <laughs> it's, it's all in good fun. So um, we will wish everybody a uh, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for the great year that we have uh, struggled through in many ways. Um, we have a lot to be thankful for and count our blessings and give hugs to those you love. Um, and uh, we will see you next week. All right.